Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this very important mayoral debate. It comes just 10 days before the start of early voting on November the 5th. I'm KPRC Channel 2 anchor and debate moderator Bill Baeza. And I'm Telemundo Houston anchor Cristal Ayala. Telemundo Houston le presenta este debate en vivo con traducción simultánea al español en nuestra página de internet telemundohouston.com y en teleexitos 47.2. Now, the candidates you see here tonight are the top candidates, according to campaign finance reports, submitted to the city by the October 7th filing deadline. Asking them questions tonight about their plans to improve our city are Houston Newsmakers host, Cambrell Marshall, Houston Chronicle City Hall reporter, Jasper Scherer, Telemundo Houston anchor, Alejandro Mendoza, and the Chair of Debates and Forums for the League of Women Voters Houston, Rita Hicks. We also have questions submitted to us by viewers, readers, and members of the audience. KPRC2 anchor, Andy Serota, and also Houston Chronicle City Hall reporter, Mike Morris, will present those from our digital desk. Now, each of these candidates have been informed of the rules of this debate in advance. The candidates will have one minute each to respond to questions, unless they are prompted by the panelists during the question for a 30-second reply. Each candidate has two 30-second rebuttals to be used as they choose tonight. They will be offered a chance to use a rebuttal only after all of the candidates have answered each question. Now, the right to these rebuttals, gentlemen, can be lost if a candidate exceeds the time allotted for an answer. Before we start, thank you to HBU's Morris Family Center for Law and Liberty for hosting us and to everyone in our audience for joining us. Also, we want to thank the League of Women Voters Houston Board member, Courtney Siegfried, for being the official timekeeper. A random drawing was done to determine which candidate would get the first answer. We begin tonight with Bill King. Rita Hicks with the League of Women Voters Houston has the question. Rita. Good evening, candidates. The first question is, ethics continue to be a leading topic during this campaign. Do the city's rules governing campaign finance or the process of awarding contracts need to be revised? And if so, what would you change? Thank you, Rita. Uh, I've actually issued a seven-point ethics plan. I do think we need campaign finance reform at the city of Houston. Um, we allow much larger campaign contributions than most any other cities do. Most have a 500 or 1,000. We allow a $5,000 limit. And by the way, it has a lot of loopholes in it. So we saw the other day where one clinic gave uh, the incumbent $128,000 in campaign contributions by over 100 different doctors contributing who, by the way, happened to do the city's work. We found one real estate developer, family and company gave $150,000. My proposal is to limit people who do business with the city to $500 per year and to ban them from certain groups, including uh, sexually oriented businesses. We are way out of step with the rest of the cities in the country and the rest of the cities in Texas. We need comprehensive campaign finance reform at the city of Houston. Thank you, Mr. King. Dwight Boykins. Right here. Thank you, Bill. Uh, first of all, I have to give a shout out to my beautiful wife and my mother that's here before I answer the question, and my brother. Good to see you all, and thanks for being here. Um, you know, I've served on city council for the past six years, and I chair the ethics committee. And I can tell you, during the six years, I made a, a conscious effort to make certain that any and everybody that I spent uh, lunchtime with or dinner with, that I paid the bill. I made it clear it was a decision I made. Rather, we need campaign reform. Uh, I think it's been addressed. Uh, I think it's about the individual and the decisions he or she will make. And as your mayor, I can assure you, you can't buy me. And just because you make a campaign contribution, <clears throat> I'm going to make decisions as best for me that I can sleep with at night. And I think that my mother will be proud to say, that's my son. Dwight Boykins, thank you, sir. Sylvester <laughs> Turner. At the state level, there are no campaign contributions. If you're running for governor, lieutenant governor, state representative, senate, there are no campaign contributions at all. Uh, at the county level, I don't think there are too many uh, campaign contribution limits either. On the city level, uh, you're restricted to 5,000 per person. 
and you cannot give any money uh, while somebody has a contract pending before city council. There's a blackout period, and it's important to adhere to those guidelines. One provision that I would change is that there is no limit on how much an individual person can spend on his or her own campaign. And I do think we need to place restrictions and limits on how much an individual person can spend on his or her campaign. For example, I don't think a person should be able to spend $5 million or $10 million on his or her campaign. I think that goes, that flies in the face of fairness across the board. Thank you, sir. Tony Busby. Was that directed at me? <laughs> You know, my, my father was a butcher. Uh, my mother drove our school bus. I was born with a, with a plastic fork in my mouth. I mean, every, every dollar I've ever made, I worked hard for it. I'm tired of politicians that go into office poor and come out after 30 years of public service and all they've done is serve themselves and they're wealthy. Are you tired of that yet? I'm tired of it. I made a commitment when I decided to run for mayor that I would take no money from anyone. When I'm your mayor, I will take no money from anyone. There are campaign donors in the city of Houston that have given millions to our current mayor that have 22 open contracts. There are lobbyists that lobby for $755 million worth of business. There is this internship that we're gonna talk about, $95,000 based on three emails. Our city is for sale. And I'm going to end it when I'm your mayor. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, sir. Any uh, rebuttals? No, oh, I'd like my Mr. rebuttal. Mr. King, 30 seconds. Yes. Uh, since Sylvester's been running for mayor, he's raised about $10 million. 80% of that money has come from people that do business with the city or are regulated by the city. This is an outlier compared to any other place in the United States. I don't care if there's not any limits at the state or at the county. There should be. And we absolutely ought to have limits at the city. There's no reason not to have them. Bill, can I have a, can I have a rebuttal as well? Yes, sir, you may. Let's also, uh, let's also remember this, guys. A lot of that money that's being received by our current incumbent is coming from out of state. Where did, where, whatever happened to the people that get the contracts, the entities that get the contracts in Houston are from Houston. Where did that go? Where is that concept? We need to make sure that we, the contracts that are received by the city of Houston are Houston contractors, or at the very least, Texas contractors, not huge campaign donors for our current incumbent. I'm going to end it when I'm your mayor. Yeah. I want a rebuttal. All right, sir. I want to encourage everyone who have a problem with this to go to DwightBoykinsForMayor.com and make a donation. I need it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Turner? I tell you, um, again, it has, in my opinion, it has, not, in chair, being the chair of the Ethics Committee, it has nothing to do with how much money you put in a race. It has everything to do with your integrity and what you do and what you choose to do when people allow you to become a public servant to serve them. And when you lose focus of that, it's time for you to step out of public service. So that's Charney. Yeah. And in part, I, I will agree to what uh, uh, Councilmember Borkins had to say. Your personal integrity is critically important. I will say to you that the same rules in terms of campaign contributions that apply today pretty much apply to Mayor Bob Lanier, uh, Mayor Bill White, Mayor Anise Parker. The rules under which I am operating today as the Mayor of City of Houston are no different than the rules that they operated. The same way that they raise money is the same way that this campaign raised money as well. If it was good for them, why is it wrong for me? Each of you has one rebuttal remaining. Kidding uh, hard <laughs> early here. All right, Houston Newsmakers host Cambrell Marshall with the next question, beginning with <coughs> Dwight Boykins. Cambrell. Mr. Boykins, this year um, Houston's police chief has faced criticism for the handling of the Harding Street raid and this week, the Houston Professional Firefighters Association issued a vote of no confidence against the city's fire chief. When concerns like these are expressed about key public safety officials, what should the mayor's role be in addressing those issues? Well, you know, they're not working for me. And as mayor, I've made it publicly clear that we will uh, go in a different direction with both police and fire leadership. We will pull within the ranks of the Houston Police Department as well as the Houston Fire Department. I think what took place on the Harding Street was, I was at the hospital, Mayor Turner and I was there together, and we spent time with 
the officers that were uh, injured as well as other family members. And the understanding that we had during that time is, was one thing. And then it came back and we heard other issues with regards to friendly fire and others, but the position the chief took, I was really disappointed in it. What's going on with the Houston Fire Department, I love, I think Chief Pena is a very nice guy, but I think what he's done is taken a bullet against the men, the rank and file of the Houston Fire Department. When you stand up against your, with your policies against what works best for them, you create this tension. And as mayor, we will bring in leadership that will gain, re regain respect in both public se sector entities. Dwight Boykins, thank you, sir. Sylvester Turner. Thank you. Uh, Chief Acevedo is doing a yeoman's job as, as head of the City of Houston Police Department. He has brought a very high standard uh, to the City of Houston Police Department. He calls a ball a ball and a strike a strike. If you adhere to the rules as a police officer, you're fine. If you violate the rules, you're going to be disciplined, and in some cases, you're going to be let go. And I appreciate that, that level of transparency and holding people to the line. With respect to Chief Pena, the head of the fire department, he has done an exceptional job in representing the fire department. He's done an exceptional job in representing the city of Houston as a whole. Uh, when it comes to apparatus and equipment for our firefighters, he has done more in a short period of time than what was done in the last 10 to 15 years for the city of Houston's fire department. And I appreciate that and respect him. I think what is critically important is that are you serving the interests and the needs of the people and are you moving the department forward? And in both cases, both Chief Officer Veda and Chief Pena are doing an exemplary job. Thank you, sir. Tony Busby. Yes, sir. I, I am a captain, former captain, retired, of course, in the United States Marine Corps, infantry and recon. And I can tell you that when you lose the faith of your troops, if you will, you can't lead. Chief Pena, three-fourths of the firefighters in the city of Houston signed a piece of paper to say they have no faith in him. He can't lead. Despite what you think about his job or what he's done, he can't lead. And let's talk about the Harden Street raid, because many of you know about this. Plainclothes police officers, based on a municipal warrant from a municipal judge appointed by this mayor, broke into somebody's home, shot their dog, shot the woman that lived there, and shot the man that lived there, all based on a lie. In the military, in the Marine Corps, heads roll. What happened instead was this mayor and the police chief stood side by side and said, we're going to try to investigate this and resisted outside investigation. We need a new police chief. Period. Thank you, sir. Bill King. Um, I like Art and Sam both, but I think we're going to have to have new leadership at both of those departments. Uh, when I look at the police department in particular, I don't see any metrics that indicate anything has improved there. Uh, one of my big concerns about the police department is the clearance rate. How many of the crimes that are committed do we actually solve? Those rates have been abysmal. They continue to be abysmal. Six percent of the burglaries, 18 uh, percent of the robberies, 38 percent of the rapes, you think about that, a rape victim comes forward and there's only a one in four chance uh, of them seeing any justice. Um, and so I don't see anything that indicates that anything's gotten any better in the police department uh, since he's been here. With respect to Harding Street raid, you know, things like this happen occasionally, but the real concern I had was that it turns out almost every city in the country has either eliminated no-knock warrants or has very strict rules around it. How did we have this completely uncontrolled uh, like we did in this particular situation? Thank you, sir. Gentlemen, any rebuttals? If yes, not, I would like, can I add one part, Bill? Uh, I mentioned about this, going this in. This is a 30 second yeah, rebuttal? I mentioned I uh, would go in a different direction uh, with the police chief and, and fire. Uh, Mayor Lee Brown has endorsed my campaign. And one of the things he did as a police chief was brought com community policing in. And it's important if you want to take the approach of going back into the neighborhoods, you have that leadership. The program I will implement is called a 30 30 plan, where police officers will be able to live in Houston drive their patrol cars home, patrol before they go to work 30 minutes, and when they return 30 minutes, play, replace, uh, put that car in the driveway, and that would deter crime immediately in neighborhoods. Thank you, sir. All right, we're going to our uh, digital desk now with Andy and Mike. Gentlemen. Houston has faced unprecedented flooding in just the last four years, uh, starting with the Memorial Day flood in 2015, and most recently from Tropical Storm Imelda. As soon as homeowners make repairs and rebuild, it happens again. 
And that, of course, has many Houstonians living in a constant state of anxiety. So we asked people to submit questions for this debate. And many that came in were flood related. These are just some of the people who wanted candidates to address how they would handle the problem, prevention, and recovery. Dylan Brown specifically asked, in hindsight, what would you have done differently during HARP? We'll begin uh, the answers with Sylvester Turner. And I didn't quite understand the last question, Mike. Could, Could you repeat in, that? In hindsight, what would you have done differently during Harvey? What would I have done differently during Harvey? Quite frankly, I would tell you, I thought Houston responded in an exceptional fashion. Um, I appreciated the work that uh, uh, the collaboration between uh, Judge Ed Emmett at the time and myself. Uh, we were very forthcoming with information at the very beginning. We told people to get prepared, uh, to make sure that they had their medicine, their groceries, their waters. Uh, preparation wasn't key. Communication was key. Uh, as the storm was approaching, we were constantly updating people during the storm. Uh, we were host holding uh, two and three press conferences, if not more, during the course of the day. Uh, I was meeting with my entire organizational team, about 40 of us in the emergency center. Uh, County Judge Ed Emin and I were constantly in communication, uh, coordinating, uh, providing uh, updates to people. Uh, Houstonians responded in a remarkable fashion. Uh, first responders were out there doing their job and they did it in an exceptional fashion. Quite frankly, uh, the city of Houston has been praised across the country for its response. Thank you, sir. Tony Busby. <laughs> Gosh, there's a long list. It's too much in one minute. I would have not I would have told the people in West Houston that they were going to open the gates in Attics and Barker's Reservoirs. I would have given them some sort of warning instead of this opening those gates at 2.30 in the morning when they went to bed and thought their homes would not be flooded. I would have mobilized the entire fire department and would have authorized the payment of overtime. I would not have went against seasoned meteorologists and say, don't listen to, me, to, to the meteorologist, listen to me, I know more about how bad this is going to be. We did not have, hugs don't work. Handing out a case of water doesn't work. And don't even get me started about how we've helped people who were crushed by Harvey. Fifteen people have been helped. Even though we've had a billion dollars sitting there to help them, we're going to do a lot better in the city of Houston because the leadership we have doesn't work. Bill King. Well, it was ridiculous that we didn't call the entire fire department into duty. Uh, there's actually emails, that some of you have probably seen, where the firefighters were ordered to stay home uh, during the storm, which is crazy. This was a four-shift alarm. They should have all been at their station. Look, Houstonians were incredible in this, going out in their bass boats and every kind, anything that floated. But one of the reasons we had to enlist so many volunteers is we built our fire department to stay home. It's crazy. Uh, what we should have done was immediately after Harvey is we should have pulled together a commission and studied what went right and what went wrong during this emergency, which, by the way, is exactly what we did after Ike. I actually chaired that commission uh, for the governor and for the local task force that redrafted evacuation plans based on what went wrong during that terrible Hurricane Rita evacuation, and it went much better in, in Ike. We should have done that this time. I will do that as soon as I'm elected mayor. Dwight Boykins. Thank you. As mayor, I think it's important that we continue our work with the Army Corps of Engineers as well as the county, Harris County Flood Control. But my approach would have been a little bit different. As a former banker, what I would have done is brought in every single bank president and asked them to, once the federal allocation was appropriated to Texas, and once we decide we'll, uh, we'll determine how much we would get, I think it was about 2.4 billion. At that point, ask those banks to take that debt on, divide it among the banks, get you two or three uh, basis points on it, put that money on the streets immediately. So the people who are suffering from reconstructed homes or new homes, they will be able to have some type of comfort a little bit quicker. Today to hear that 10 and 11 homes are being built and we're two years into this flood, there's no excuse for that. So we could talk about the GLO, GLO process, but my approach as your mayor would be out of the box thinking and always make certain we take care of the residents and put them first. Any rebuttals, Mayor? Yes. The response by the city and the county prior to and during uh, Harvey was exceptional. Uh, the county judge and I were informed Houstonians and people in Harris County on a regular basis about what was happening. With respect to the release of water by the Corps of Engineers, 
neither the county judge, Ed Emmett, nor myself were advised by the Corps of Engineers that the water was going to be released. Had we been advised, we would have immediately notified the people in the city and the county so they would have known. Any other rebuttals? All right, sir, then uh, we're, here is Jasper now uh, with the Houston Chronicle with a question uh, beginning with Tony Busby for the answer. Mr. Busby, turning now to the prevention aspect and choosing how funds are used, we'd like to focus on the drainage fee, which is used for drainage and street repairs. How should Houston balance the real need to address flooding with the city's other urgent infrastructure needs? Well, that's like, Jasper, thank you for the question. That's like a softball. We've been talking about this for almost 11 months. We, we have a drainage fee. Remember Prop A was just a re uh, a re-election on the drainage fee that's really been around for, for more than 10 years. Did you know that we spend only a fraction of that drainage fee on drainage projects, even though every single voter that voted in favor of that drainage fee expected that those monies would be in fact used on drainage projects? The mayor, your current mayor, your incumbent mayor, considers filling potholes to be a drainage project. I disagree with that. I think we should be spending a drainage fee, which is a pay-as-you-go process. It, it re generates revenue of more than $100 million a year, not a bonded process, a five- to eight-year project idea, but in fact a one- to two-year project idea on some low-hanging fruit that we can bring mitigation and flooding to the neighborhoods across the city of Houston by using 100% of that drainage fee on drainage. Bill King. So, Jasper, I have to disagree with the premise that's included in your question that the current drainage fee is all spent on drainage and streets. That's not correct. The current drainage fee goes into a big pot of money along with a bunch of other sources. And from that, we withdraw a certain amount of money that goes into capital projects. But in addition to the drainage fee, we also get money from Metro, which used to go to capital projects. Actually, this administration has reduced the amount transferred to capital projects from $160 million a year down to around $120 million a year. What we do know is this. We do know that we, spend, we, we pay in about $110 million of drainage fees a year. And we know that we're doing about 50 or $60 million of drainage fee, war, of drainage work per year. That means that half of the drainage fee that you're paying in is going to something else. Now, that's legal under the Charter Amendment. It's just terrible public policy. We need to spend every penny of the drainage fee on drainage. Dwight Boykins. Thank you. As a member during the creation of Rebuild Houston, as a non-engineer, just a regular resident, I served on the creation of this board. And there are four funding sources. And I can tell you, as your mayor, we would definitely look at restructuring them where major thoroughfares would take a back seat to residential streets. So this is just a small example of a street. The red represents inlets on the end of each street. As your mayor, we will go in and offer, issue RFQs to add additional inlets on the inside of every street. So every residential street with curbing gutters will have eight inlets. So when rain hits your street, immediately it would have somewhere to go before it get clogged up on the inlets. So we have to take a different approach. And then we will take community parks and turn them into multi-use. When, when it's raining, it can be a detention pond. When it's dry, the park then can be usable for a green space. So we have to do things a little bit different with the resources we have. Thank you, sir. Sylvester Thank you. Turner. Thank you. Based on what was passed in 2010, every dollar from Rebuild Houston, your drainage fee, must go to drainage and streets. The way it operates in the city of Houston, your streets are part of the drainage system. Water, we prefer to put water in the streets, not in your homes. The water goes from the streets to the bayous. That's controlled by the Harris County Flood Control District. They then take the water to the Gulf. But every single dollar, every single dollar, goes to your drainage and streets, which is a part of your overall drainage system. That's the way it works. The metro dollars, that's a separate category, but it's all a part of the overall system, but we segregate the metro dollars from your drainage and street program. All of this, we have redesigned the website to make it clear for people to go and see for themselves the projects that are being funded, when we send a project to city council for approval, we specifically de delineate the funding source. Thank you, sir. Any rebuttal? I'd like a rebuttal on this. Yes, sir. All right. 
Okay, the money is absolutely not segregated. It's put into one account, and once it's in there, it's fungible, and you don't know what any particular dollar goes to. We absolutely do not spend all of that money on streets and drainage. There's about a quarter of it that goes to pay 500 employees that work at Public Works, most of them bureaucrats working down at City Hall. And by the way, a bunch of the street projects that is paid for are asphalt overlays. Asphalt overlays don't improve drainage, they make it worse. Uh, How many do we have, Bill? You we have, you have, have one more? remaining and everybody else is done with rebuttals. We may as well, be, <laughs> we may as well close it out, man. All right, sir. You, you know what, guys, and I got to be honest with you, you know what the most crazy thing I learned when I was began to study how, and this city has absolutely no transparency. It is almost impossible to figure out how we spend money in this city, and they never respond to Freedom of Information Act requests. Did you know that they took almost every public works employee and put them over to the dedicated drainage fee? So every person you see out there that's fixing a the street, they're doing drainage absolutely ridiculous. That's not what the people voted for. We're going to do better when I'm your mayor. All right, sir. Thank you. Uh, we are done with rebuttals here for the rest of the uh, debate, and we move on now to <laughs> Alejandro with Telemundo. I wish we had more rebuttals, Bill. Some more, yeah. <laughs> for Bill King. Buenas noches a todos. Good night, everybody. As candidates, you'll seemingly agree the city needs more police officers. According to the city finance department, the average annual cost for each police officer's salary and benefits is about $139,000, or roughly 14 million for every 100 officers added to the force. So, Mr. King, how will you fund any added personnel cost? Well, I don't know whether we need any additional personnel cost or not. I do think we need about 500 new police officers, but whether or not all the other departments need all the people they need or not, I don't know. And that's why I've long been an advocate for zero-based budgeting. This is a process where we go in and we take every budget back to zero and every department has to justify why they're spending any dollars. This has been used in the private and public sector very successfully. In the 2015 campaign, Sylvester and I both promised over and over and over that we would both implement zero-based budgeting. Four years later, we still do not have zero-based budgeting. We're still incrementally budgeting. By the way, the revenues in the last three years, according to our last audit, the revenues of the city are up by $480 million a year. Make sure you understand, this administration had $480 million more to operate the city than Anise Parker did in her last year. Guess how much of the expenses are up? $650 million. Tony Busby. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, did you know that we have 5,200 police officers in the city of Houston or thereabouts? Uh, the number moves around a little bit. Only 2,300 are assigned to the patrol division. Most police departments across the country have about 60% of their police officers assigned to patrol. And let's, let's be clear. The best way to fight crime is to prevent it from happening in the first instance. That means deterrence. When you leave here tonight and if you see a police officer, which is going to be highly unlikely except in the mayor's uh, two car detail, you're probably going to look at your speedometer or tap your brake. Deterrence is where it's at. We should have 60% of our police officers on the street. We only have 44%. Right there, we can put an additional three or 400 police officers on the street to make a big difference in crime. 664 square miles across this city that we have only 2,300 police officers to cover. Did you know we have 23,000 gang members? We got to do better. Sylvester Turner. When I came into office as your mayor, we had 5,100 police officers. Now we have 5,300, and that number is increasing. In every single year, as your mayor, I have put forth a part of the budget for city council members to approve five cadet classes in every single year, pretty much at maximum capacity. Just this June, a city council approved five cadet classes, about 70 police officers cadets per class. We are increasing those numbers. We need about 600 more. It will cost about $90 million. Let me just say, I've done zero-based budgeting. That's a process. That doesn't necessarily generate revenue. 
you have to identify what your priorities are. So for anyone who says, let's just do zero-based budgeting, that does not mean you're going to generate one single dollar. What we are doing is that we are streamlining the process, we're adding more police officers, we need about 600 more, and we are holding the line. Thank you, sir. Dwight Boykins. Thank you. Um, you know, I sit at the council table, and I can assure you a zero-based budget approach is what the city needs. I sat during the budget process when department heads brought in their wish list, and when they identified their expenditures, they made it clear if we approve what they ask, they can then hire additional staff. So let me be clear about that. As your mayor, I would definitely bring in a zero-based budget approach and make certain that we be very fiscal conservative with the dollars that we have. But what I plan to bring to the table as well is protecting your neighborhoods. I'm a neighborhood type of leader. My 30-30 plan, again, would have immediate impact in your neighborhood where police officers will take their cars home if they live in the city of Houston, patrol 30 minutes before they go to work and 30 minutes when they return. And if that car is parked in the driveway, it would deter crime immediately in neighborhoods. But let's talk about the fire department. We keep talking about police like that's the only first responder we have in the city. The men and women of the fire department, if you knew how they were gutted, where their special revenue fund going to the city's general fund, you wouldn't believe what they have to deal with with the revenues they receive. Thank you, sir. We're going back to our digital desk with Andy and Mike, uh, and Dwight Boykins will have the first uh, answer. Bill, thanks a lot. Now to Houston traffic, two words that can make any Houstonian's blood pressure rise. Traffic is a major concern in our city, and research done by the Kinder Institute backs that up. Uh, when put against other major issues like crime, the economy, even flooding, traffic seen here in green is the biggest concern for Houstonians in the 2019 survey. Questions submitted for tonight ranged from the light rail to bike lanes to, of course, commuter traffic. Jason Asnar posed this question to our candidates. At what point do we say enough of massive highway expansions and turn to real alternative transportation ways? Mr. Boykins, we'll add, what will you do to get Houston moving more efficiently? I've said once and I say again, as a 16-year member at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo, I love my pickup truck, <laughs> and I'm going to continue to drive it. But I can tell you back in the days, when I worked in Washington, D.C., then Majority Leader Tom DeLay was the, uh, the, the leader of the House, and he made a point to try to send federal dollars here that have put our city so far behind for bus mass transit. Federal transportation dollars were going to the East Coast. If we would have been ahead of the curve during that time, we would have above ground rail and below surface. As your mayor, I will make certain that I use every relationship with Department of Trans Transportation to pursue uh, additional mass transit. I look forward to support, I mean rail, I'm sorry, I look forward to support Metro Next. That's extending rail from my district to the airport. And I think our city is so far behind, and we should have been ahead of that curve getting to these airports a long time ago. Thank you, sir. Bill King. Uh, we're about to go through the most incredible technological disruption of our lifetimes in the way vehicles are going to get around in the future. Uh, the future vehicles are going to be guided by 5G and AI, not by steel rails. We spent $2.2 billion on light rail. We have 15% fewer transit riders than we had back in 2003 before we had any light rail. Does anybody think that we've solved the traffic problem with that $2.2 billion that we spent on light rail? If you really want to do something about traffic, it's about managing our grid and making it more efficient. It's about managing incidents, uh, wrecks on the freeways, uh, tr uh, intersections that are problematic. It's about signalization, and it's about being ready for this technological disruption that we're going to have and making for sure we can have a traffic grid that can use that new technology. Tony Busby. You know, we're the energy capital of the world. Are you telling me we can't synchronize the lights? We can synchronize the lights. That moves traffic. Are you telling me that we have the number one medical center in the entire world, and we're not smart enough to stage the type of uh, construction that occurs. How many times you've been driving on the freeway or in on Richmond or other streets where there's people that the the construction projects coned off, but nobody's working? Are there construction projects and all four arteries that you're trying to get through to get to your job or get to your kid's school? 
We've got to be smarter. Here's the biggest problem we have with regard to moving around across the city, and I agree. This Metro Next thing, I'm, I don't trust it. I don't trust it. You look at the Post Oak bus lane where they spent $200 million on a bus lane that no one's ever going to use. It bothers me. It bothers me a lot. We're going to do a lot better. But think about this. We spend so much money on freeways to get people back into a city that they don't want to live in. We need to make this city where people want to live in it again. Sylvester Turner. The city has changed since the 1990s. We need multimodal forms of transportation and transit. I support, strongly support the Metro Next. We do need light rail. We do need bus rapid transit. We do need two-way HOV lanes, more parking rides, more money for sidewalks. All of those things are included in Metro Next. Uh, we need to be able to take people from point A to point B. We need high comfort bike lanes in the city of Houston. There are a lot of people in our city now that want a, a city that's more walkable, pedestrian friendly. And so we need to be able to redesign and construct a city, not for today, but for tomorrow. Between now and 2040, we are expecting 3.8 million more people to be coming into our region. We can't be stuck on the freeways and gridlock. We have to provide people with options to be competitive. The things that people have looked for in other cities, other states, other countries, they expect to find that in a global city right here. Thank you, sir. My colleague, Cambrell Marshall, with a question for Sylvester Turner. Mayor Turner, we've heard concern about affordable housing from some people who submitted questions uh, for this debate. With homes becoming more expensive and wages not increasing as rapidly, what should the city's role be in ensuring that Houstonians have access to affordable housing? And the focus needs to be on building affordable housing. I will tell you, under my administration, we have probably built an 2,100 units of affordable housing, even more. That's just on the, the Houston Housing Authority program, 2,100 units there. We're building more affordable units in, in places all throughout the city, whether it's in Sunnyside, whether it's in Acres Home, whether it's in Magnolia Place on the East End. We have to build more affordable housing. And then for people who are first-time home users, we are providing a $30,000 subsidy for people who are getting into the home market for the very first time. We're utilizing what we call the Community Land Trust, where the city continues to own the land, but you can own the building, the house on top of the land. It reduces the amount of your monthly uh, payment. We're providing multiple options so that people can live in our city and can do so in a much affordable way. And we are increasing people's livable wage in order for them to be able to afford the rent or their mortgage. Dwight Boykins. Thank you. That's a major difference in the mayor and I. First of all, the community land trust is something uh, I just don't even understand why it's even being considered. My mother grew, raised her six boys in some projects and apartments. And once my mother and her, my stepfather got married, we purchased our first home. And when we walked in the backyard, I'll never forget that day that my toes touched the grass. And I looked up and say, hey, this is the American dream. And when I became a council member, that was my focus. I told every developer, if you're talking about bringing multifamily projects in my district, you might as well go to the next room. I'm about single family dwelling, but this is what I want to do with it. We have close to 600 vacant lots in the city of Houston. If we take those lots and put an average of $150,000 home on that lot, times average of six or $7,000 a year in property taxes, that's equate to 10, 15, 20 million dollars where that money will go in the general fund and then that money is reduced because of our revenue cap, reducing your property taxes. So forget the apartments. I'm talking about single family dwelling. God requires us to own land. Thank you, sir. Bill King. I hope I'm not making God mad that I live in a condo, but um, <laughs> yeah, that doesn't count do that. as my time. Wait, we'll still, we don't want to do that. Now. No, that um, joke counts. <laughs> So, first of all, most of the 2,100 units he's talking about were actually started under the Parker administration, just finished under this administration. There's actually been very little new uh, projects started under this administration. One that was started was a renovation of a hospital over in the Fifth Ward to change it, to turn it into low-income housing. It's going to cost $300,000 a unit. 
$300,000 a unit for affordable housing, really, you know, we could build a couple of pretty nice houses. I think Dwight's got this right. We've got a ton of vacant lots in this city that are not being used, many of which there are delinquent taxes on. I worked with Bill White back in his administration on getting those back into the public sector, and we need to do an urban uh, homestead project where if you come in and can afford to finance your house, we give you those lots. Tony Busby. Yeah, after Hurricane Harvey, the city um, modified the, the code and made it even more difficult to build affordable housing in the city of Houston and almost eliminated the, the incentives for any developer. See, a career politician, and there's, and there's a, many years of career politicians on this stage, with the exception of me, they look at things like how much money can we throw at things or who can we give things away to. Here's what I'm worried about. I'm worried that our school system is so bad and we got to work on it that people don't feel comfortable putting their kids in HISD. I'm worried that, that people who want to raise children in this city don't feel like they're safe or don't feel like they can afford a home, so they go to Friendswood and Katy and all other places. And then we want to talk about subsidies. I'm talking about let's amend some of these codes in areas that we know don't flood to encourage developers to develop housing that people can afford. That's what I'm going to be focused on as the mayor because too many times people are moving further and further outside of the city and we're spending billions on freeways so they can come in to work. Thank you, sir. Now here's Alejandro once again with uh, Telemundo for a question, with a question for Tony Busby. Yes, sir. There are many people here in Houston who are immigrants or families of mixed status. They are often scared and suspicious of the government or law enforcement. Mr. Busby, under your administration as mayor, what will you do to make sure everyone feels comfortable interacting with law enforcement in their neighborhoods? Yeah, that's a great question because I, I first off, when we talk about the census, for instance, there's, the, there's people that we hear from that say, you know, I'm too scared to be counted. And we're gonna make sure that everybody is counted because, not because of, as the mayor says, we get more money, because we want to know how many people in our city, because I believe that we're larger than Chicago. Wouldn't that be awesome? If we were the, we were the third largest city in the country, I think we could be. Look, I've spent my entire life fighting discrimination cases in court, black, brown, no matter who you are, sexual orientation. Um, I think it all starts with the mayor and being clear that we're a welcoming city and that we're not going to tolerate any sort of discrimination and we're not going to be targeting people. We're going to make sure everybody has a seat at the table. Sylvester Turner. When I came into office, I set up a new department, the New Americans Department, which brings in different groups, representatives from different uh, groups, immig immigrant communities uh, within the city of Houston as an advisory group. And what we have said to uh, individuals, regardless of where you come from, this is the most diverse city in the country. One out of four Houstonian is foreign born. And we've made it very clear that regardless of where you come from, if you're in this city, in the 640 square miles, I am your mayor, El Cade, I am your mayor. We've made it very clear. And what's important is that you have to go in the communities where they are. I've sat at their tables. I've been in their living rooms. I've been in their communities. I've worked with the various groups, stakeholder groups, throughout our city. Even during Hurricane Harvey, I made it very clear. If you're an immigrant and you were impacted by Harvey, reach out to us. We want to represent you and make sure that you get your assistance. When the issue came up about mass deportation, I was out there on the front line letting people know what their due process rights were. Thank you, sir. Dwight Boykins. Thank you. When the issue hit, uh, I, al I also was part of that off of Emancipation Boulevard. But let me tell you, graduating from Stephen F. Austin High School and growing up with 90% of my high school classmates uh, being Hispanic, I learned a lot. Houston is definitely a welcoming city. And as your mayor, I can assure you, we will eliminate as much discrimination to any race as possible. My police chief will make certain that's a, a directive and if he or she decides not to take that, they will no longer be a part of this. One of the things I think is important as well, we had a council, we have 16 council members, five at large and 11 district. We have not had an at large Hispanic council member since Gracie, Sines and Orlando Sanchez. So as mayor, the first opening that we have for an at large position, I give you my word, I will advocate to make and support that we have the first, the third Hispanic at-large council member that can help deal with these immigration issues. Bill King. 
So my late brother-in-law's name was Ronaldo Rivas. And uh, Ray was born in this country, but his father immigrated from Mexico. He immigrated here so that his children could be born in the United States. Ray went on to the Air Force, uh, got a GI Bill, went to college, uh, learned um, telemetry, and literally became a rocket scientist at NASA and spent his career there before he retired and passed away a couple of years ago. I think it's a great story. For Houston, it's a great story for America. We desperately need comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do much at the city except advocate about, for that. Uh, when I was writing for the Houston Chronicle, I probably wrote more about that topic than I did anything else. But we're also a nation of laws, and we've got to enforce our immigration laws. Now, that's primarily a federal responsibility. I don't think the city police ought to be trying to enforce immigration laws, but we do need to honor ICE detainer warrants uh, when we have those. Thank you, sir. Now here's Rita with uh, League of Women Voters. Question for Bill King. Mr. King, we're staying on this topic for a question which you'll have 30 seconds to answer. The 2020 census is right around the corner, and the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce has issued a report stating, quote, for a state that is home to more than 5 million immigrants, the potential financial pitfalls of a flawed population count are significant. The report goes on to say, in Houston, the impact of an undercount could have, uh, the impact an undercount could have on the city's bottom line could be devastating. What will you do as mayor to ensure everyone, regardless of immigration status, income, or age, gets counted? So I don't think there's going to be any disagreement up here that we need the best count that we can get. And this is actually something I want to commend uh, Sylvester and the council on doing. They've contracted with some people to make sure that we get a good count. Outreach firms, I think it was the right thing to do, and I'll continue that under my administration. Dwight Boykins. Uh, thank you, Bill, for that, because you're absolutely correct. Uh, the mayor and council, we approved a contract uh, to make certain that this, uh, that everyone will be counted, to her point. Um, and I took pride in that, and uh, the lead on the contract is a Hispanic firm that's well qualified, and the sub on that is an African-American firm. So the goal is to make certain that we take down any barrier that will keep individ individuals from feeling uncomfortable uh, giving up important informa personal information uh, to prevent them from being counted. Thank you, sir. Sylvester Turner. And we have already established the Complete Count Committee. We are working directly with the county, with County Judge Lena Hidalgo and her entire team. Just on yesterday, we opened up the first regional office on the Complete Count Committee, working in conjunction with Harris County as well as with Fort Bend. We are putting up, we will be putting up yard signs. We are treated like a campaign to encourage people to participate in the census. We're working with community groups because you have to deal with, with communities, with organizations that have already garnered the trust of people in our city. Tony Busby. Yeah, there's, there are two people in this audience. I, of course, I've already said I want everybody counted. There's two people in this audience, one of which came to me to work. I helped him get his green card and then continued to kick him in the rear end until he finally went in to take his citizenship test and now is a U.S. citizen. The other of which I met when I was in the United States Marine Corps, who was from Venezuela, who immigrated here with his wife and two daughters, who now is also a U.S. citizen. Politicians talk, I do things, and that's what I'm going to do as your mayor. Thank you, sir. Now here is uh, Jasper with a question for Dwight Boykins. Mr. Boykins, for years the city has run a structural budget deficit. What needs to, ch to happen to change that? Thank you, Jasper. Again, the zero-based budget approach is what I'll be taking. And, at, you know, when you sit at the table, you, and, and to, to Tony's comment about a politician, I'm a public servant. I'm not a politician because I take it serious. Yeah, it's on. I can't hear you, but, yeah, it's on. Mike's not working. Your mic's not working. Department would have to justify their expenditures. Once they justify their expenditures, we you want to come to Mike? You want to come up here? I don't think we can hear him. Yep. Uh, I think that uh, Sylvester Turner is offering his microphone for you to, to answer that. Yeah. Oh, here, here comes a mic. Yeah. Could you yep. go ahead and, and start over again? Sir? <clears throat> thank you very much. I said thank you for your question, Jasper. I said. Uh, the approach of a zero-based budget, I believe, looking at the $5 billion that we deal with, I sat at the table, 
I sit on the budget committee and I watch when the department heads come in and give you the numbers they want you to have. As mayor, every department and deputy director will resign, reapply for their job. But the reason I want someone in there who I know is going to tell me the truth, because they, their job will be on the line with it. We need to have a clear cut of what the numbers are with the city. Let me be clear for the record. I'm not saying people losing their job. What I'm saying is you have to earn your job under my administration so I will know I'm getting accurate information. We have to make the pay parity for the Houston firefighters and the Houston police officers a number one priority. And as, a mayor, as a, your mayor, I can promise you that will be my number one priority. Thank you, sir. And apologize for the microphone. Sylvester Turner. The structural, the structural <clears throat> imbalance is due to primarily three reasons years ago. The first one was pensions, rising cost of pensions. We have addressed that. Pensions were $8.2 billion unfunded liability when I came into office. That's now down to 4.03. And all three credit rating agencies are giving us a thumbs up. So we've done that. We've corrected that. The second one uh, deals with what we call other post-employment benefits. That's similar to a pension issue. It's been around for 10, 12 years, and we're working on addressing that. That's the long-term insurance liability uh, for our city employees. That's the OPEL. The third one, based on the credit uh, rating uh, agencies, is the revenue cap. That's in place. And that pretty much will remain in place until the voters decide they want to do something else. But even if the voters in Houston decided to do something else, the state has imposed its own revenue cap on top of cities and counties. So those are the reasons for the structural imbalance. Tony Busby. Yeah, there's, 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 and there's more than three, but there's three basic ways to do budgeting. There's performance-based budgeting, of course. There's zero-based budgeting, which you've heard a lot about, and the commitment that the mayor made last time around, which he has not lived up to. And then there's, and then there's of course, incremental budgeting, which is what the city of Houston does. And frankly, many bureaucracies do. Basically, all the department heads are told, OK, you had this amount of money last time around, and now you're going to get a certain percentage more based on cost of living increases or based on inflation. And guess what? Government will spend every single penny you give them, every single penny, without relation to the job that they need to perform. And don't get me started about TERSs. If you know what a TERS is across the city, they're wasting money. The enterprise funds are wasting money. Dedicated funds are wasting money. We need somebody who is willing to go in there and not, will, not so worried about ruffling feathers, but saving money so we can provide the services that we are required to provide you, as I am required to provide you as your next mayor. I hope you'll support me. Bill, Bill King. So almost everything that Sylvester says about the city's finances are fabricated. He says we have a balanced budget. I brought with me tonight page eight out of our CAFR, which shows the change in net assets in the city for the last fiscal year. If you go down this column where you see this little yellow, you'll see 435. It's in parentheses, and that stands for millions. In parentheses, by the way, if you're not a financial person, that's a negative number. We ran a $435 million operating deficit last year in the general fund. It's the largest deficit we've ever run in the general fund in the history of the city. At the same time that we have record revenues and the economy is actually doing pretty well. By the way, we don't have a revenue cap. We have a property tax cap. And what it says is that your property taxes cannot be raised in the aggregate by more than about 3 to 4 percent a year without coming back and asking for your approval. If you really think that you need more revenue and you can justify it, go ask the people for it. Thank you, sir. M now here, uh, once again, is Cambrell with uh, another question, beginning this time with Sylvester Turner. Mr. Turner, this creating a thriving economy in a large metropolitan city like Houston means attracting big companies while also supporting small business development. So we only have 30 seconds to give an answer on each of these. So please identify one thing on your agenda as mayor, just one thing that will support economic development in either the corporate or small business sector. Establishing and building out the ecosystem, startups, technology, and innovation. When I came in four years ago on the Kaufman Foundation report, we were like 31. Now we are fast and moving and building out the ecosystem. Rice is taking that uh, the OCS building, turning it into an innovation hub. We're establishing the innovation corridor from downtown to the medical center. The CEO of Microsoft, 
was just in my office sitting down talking with me on Wednesday morning because Microsoft is coming into the city in a major way. You have companies in Silicon Valley coming to hashtag Silicon Bayou. Thank you, sir. Dwight Boykins. <laughs> As Mayor Canberra, the first thing I would do is make certain we have a quality education system in Houston. I think the first thing we need to do is make certain the interim superintendent, Dr. Latham, becomes permanent. I think she's doing a fantastic job turning schools around in our city. Once that happens, companies tend to come to your city. I think our tax rate is attractive. When you compare our tax rate to California, New York, that's why a lot of major companies are coming here. Not because we look good. They're coming because they like our tax structure and the weather. Bill King. We have to fix flooding. Uh, our flooding is beginning to really damage our national brand. If we don't get on top of this, this is going to be an existential threat to the region's prosperity. Um, every place I go outside the city, all people want to talk about is, well, how bad is it really in Houston? What's going on? Is everybody's house flooded down there? We have gotten a national reputation as being a place that floods. Companies are not going to come here if they don't think that we can protect their employees' homes from flooding. Tony Busby. Yes, sir, Bill. The city of Houston proper, that is, the city limits are not growing. The city's not growing. It's stagnant. Everywhere around the city and the region is growing. The reason that companies do not want to relocate here is not just flooding, but it is, and it is damaging our brand, but it's also HISD. And for the small entrepreneurs, the smaller businesses that are trying to do their best to, to open a business, our permitting department is probably one of the worst I've ever dealt with, and I've built tons and tons of structures. We have got to do better. The city is broken. We're at a crossroads. We need a new mayor who's not a career politician. We are... Uh we're uh, close to get, uh, quickly getting to the end of our time here. We're going to have move, on, move on to closing remarks. Again, the order was selected randomly. Uh, during the candidates' comments, you'll see on your screen the words submitted by each campaign team that they feel best describes their candidate. I apologize. I, do you all remember the order that you drew for closing? I was number four. <laughs> okay. It's, I think it's, the fix it, is in. It, it is you. You're, you're number one. Oh, I'm number one now? Yes. Oh, good. How much time do I got, Bill? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30, I'm gonna, in 30 seconds, I'm going to try to convince you why we need new leadership in the city of Houston. We're the energy capital of the world, but our streets are the worst in the United States. We have the number one med center in the world, but yet we can't do anything about flooding. We are the most charitable city in the country, but yet we are the hub for human and sexual trafficking, and our homeless population is out of control. We need a Marine. When when the city, when there's a problem, what do we do? Send in the Marines. I'm Tony Busby. I want to be your mayor. Sylvester Turner. Sylvester Turner. Let me just say, number one, this is a great city. I'm a proven leader. During my four years, we've faced three major storms, Harvey being the most rain on any city in this country's history. And as a city, together, we came through it. When I came in, pensions were at the highest rate, 8.2 billion, and now it's down to 4.03. Unemployment, in June, July, uh, the lowest unemployment rate since 1981. More people are working today. A great city, let's keep it going. Dwight Boykins. <laughs> Dwight Boykins. You know, experience matters. I talk about the book of Matthews, talk about how God ordained people to be servants. Uh, my wife and I have accepted that calling. We take pride in blessing others. As your mayor, I can assure you, I will wake up every morning doing what I can to make your, le uh, your life better. But I do want to correct something the mayor talk about the pension. He, need, he keep leaving out the part that he balanced the pension on the back of the Houston firefighters. And I think that's important to be said because the families of the Houston firefighters are suffering because of his structural balance. Bill, Bill King. We do live in a great city, but we have a city government that's not living up to the greatness of our city. Our streets are embarrassment. We can't protect our citizens from crime or flooding. We can't balance our budget. Uh, we can't control contracts going out to people on the basis of merit. We can do better than this. I'm prepared to do this job. 
I've studied these issues. Everything in my 40 years experience in this city in the public and private sector has prepared me to do this job. If you will get me there this time, I promise you I'll give you a city hall that works and that you can be proud of. Gentlemen, we thank you all for being here for this debate. Thank you for being with us as well. Thank you for watching. We hope you'll go out and vote on November the 5th.